So there's this man. He uh, walks into a restaurant with a full-grown turkey following behind him. Gets up to the counter, asks for a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. Waitress turns to the turkey. What will it be? And the turkey says, I'll have the same. Short time later, the uh, waitress brings the order and says, that will be 1043, please. The fellow reaches into his pocket, pulls out the exact change, and pays for the food. <laughs> Next day, the fellow returns to the restaurant, turkey following right behind, orders a hamburger, french fries, and a Coke. Turkey orders the same. Once again, after he receives his order, he pays with the exact change, reaches into his pocket, pulls out $10.43. Well, this goes on for a few days. And then one day he comes in with the turkey, sits down, and the waitress comes and says, usual? Nah, it's Friday evening, and um, I think I'm going to have a steak, baked potato, and a cook. She looks at the turkey, and the turkey says, I'll have the same. Short time later, the waitress brings their order and says that will be $32.63. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out the exact amount and hands it to the waitress. Now, the waitress, she, is, she just can't hold back. How do you manage to always come up with the exact amount uh, in your pocket every time? Well... Several years ago, I was cleaning the attic, and I found an old lamp. And when I rubbed it, a genie appeared and offered me two wishes. My first wish was that if I ever have to pay for anything, when I reach into my pocket, I will always have the exact amount. Well, the waitress says, that is brilliant. Most people would ask for a million dollars, but you... <laughs> Your wish, you're, you're as rich as you want to be. You can pay for anything. And he says, that's exactly right. Uh, if I want a Rolls Royce, I just reach into my pocket and the exact amount is there. Uh, it's always there. The waitress says, well, one other thing. What's with the turkey? Well, that was my second wish. I wanted a chick with great legs who would agree with everything I said. November. <laughs> a turkey joke. And, and during the month of November, and you're ahead of me, you know what's going on. Uh, I've decided to preach a series of messages on Thanksgiving. And, and today's message is the second in this series. Uh, I'm calling it uh, Give Thanks. And, and last week, we gave thanks for the local church. If you were here, you remember the message. We're thankful because we are all different. We're thankful because uh, there's a, a common cause and we are devoted to that cause. We are thankful that God has called us to be dependent. We're, we depend on one another. This is what makes a church great. So this morning, I'd like us to give thanks for the walk. Now, did a little research on translations from the Bible. And the word walk is no longer being used in so many of the translations. Uh, the word walk to describe a certain manner of life. Uh, it's a term that's fallen out of use in the church. In the New Living Translation of verse 1, it reads, Therefore I, a prisoner of serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. The RSVV, the Revised Standard Version, uh, says this, that you lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. The Living Bible reads, Live and act in a way worthy of those who have been chosen for such wonderful blessings as these. Well, they're easy to understand, these passages from the different translations. Not as dynamic as the King James Version or the New King James that reads that we should 
walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Better still, the Peterson translation. Now, before I read you the Peterson translation, let me give you a little background information. Uh, 2,000 years ago, St. Paul is imprisoned for being a Christian. He's had a wonderful life of ministry. He's been a missionary. He's preached the gospel. He's been teaching about Jesus. And now toward the end of his life, they've arrested him, put him in a cell. And from this cell, all he can do is write letters of encouragement to the church. And that's what we have here in uh, Ephesians. He's writing a letter to the different people who are now making up the Christian church. He's writing about spiritual blessings, uh, about the church being one in Christ and how we all need to work together. And then he makes this statement, according to Peterson. He writes this. In light of all this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here as a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Walk on the road God has called you to travel. I think that's an excellent term for the Christian life, to walk the road God has called us to travel. Walk that road in sight of God. Uh, this is something we need to be doing working together and striving for, and on occasion giving thanks to God for this wonderful walk. I remember years ago, I heard a preacher make a statement, and it really took me by, by surprise, and um, after thinking about it, I thought, you know what? I agree with him absolutely, every single word. What a, a marvelous pronouncement. And so I've kind of adopted this as my uh, theme for walking with God, uh, my philosophy. This is my creed of life as a Christian minister. And this is what he said. If at the end of my life I discover there is no God and there is no life after death, I will have no regrets because living the Christian life is the best life a person can live. I thought, amen. And I believe that with all my heart. Now, I believe that there is a hereafter and there is a God and there is an eternity, but if someone pulled the rug from out under me, I'd still be living this life just the way I live it today. It's a great life. It's a great walk. And it's a wonderful privilege to be walking with Jesus. In this book of Ephesians, Paul talks about the walk or the lifestyle of a Christian in such a way that if you are a real believer, then you are grateful. You should be thankful that you are a Christian. So with that said, follow along in your insert. And the first point I'd like to make is simply decided. And again, reading from Ephesians 4, the first verse, Paul writes, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life, walk a walk, worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I'm, I'm so grateful, so thankful that we have found the way to live a fulfilling life. This is the Christian life. And this is a decided walk. By decided, I'm saying that this Christian life is determined. It's clear cut. It is absolute, it is positive, it's an emphatic way of living. And it's possible 
by the power of God and his Holy Spirit. It's because of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we can remain focused and determined. That's the way God wants us to walk. These are the gifts spelled out in verse number two. Humbleness, gentleness, patience. It says forbearance. Paul saying, be humble of spirit, be gentle. Boy, we need these qualities in the church. Uh, in the original language, the word humble literally means a thankful sense of dependence upon God. Now, while gentle is from the Greek word praeotis, and it means that we emphasize, or em we are emphatic with uh, those who are hurting, who are sympathetic with those who are struggling, uh, lacking, we are because we have the compassion of Christ in us. That's the patience that God wants from us, the forbearance. We love and respect others despite of their obvious flaws, right? <laughs> this is how we walk. This is how we live as Christians. And there's no other way. No other way that is fulfilling. In my 30 plus years as a pastor, I've learned a few things about people. And especially about those who are bitter and angry and negative about others. Uh, usually, these people uh, have found it impossible to forgive themselves. Something has happened in their life. Someone has disappointed them or hurt them. And instead of forgiving and moving on, they hold on to that bitterness. And not only do they keep it for themselves, but they make certain that others around them are just as miserable as they are. They, they walk around with a perpetual scowl on their face. And they live empty and unfulfilling lives. And when they're in the church, it does nothing but damage. <laughs> it hurts the local church. It does not have to be. I was watching the last Republican debate. I think this is number three. And if you've been reading it in the paper, you know Jeb Bush is fading. And uh, Marco Rubio, he is climbing in the polls. And uh, in this third debate, Bush must have decided the only way that he can move up in the standings is to attack Marco Rubio. Um, and he decided he was going to question Rubio's work ethic. Uh, apparently, Marco had missed uh, a few days in the Senate, and so I guess Jeb thought it would be a great line if he said this. The Senate, what is it? Like a French work week? You get up like three days where you have to show up? This was his zinger. And so... Rubio's response was that Bush had only taken that a line of attack because, and I quote, someone convinced you that attacking me is going to help you. And now while Rubio was able to brush off that remark and continue on, what Bush said had an effect. It lit up the internet. I'll tell you, it was on Facebook and Twitter it was in the news. It was on television. The French did not appreciate what he said. <laughs> and they were angry. <laughs> and just a few days later, Bush had to make a public apology. He was sorry that he had insulted uh, the French people, the nation. Isn't it amazing? Here we have all these Republicans running for president. And... When they're not throwing jabs at the current president in the White House, they're battling each other. They're insulting each other. They're throwing darts at each other. Uh, sure glad I'm not in politics. 
guess what? The same thing happens in the church. It does. I'll tell you. I've been at the receiving end of some of those darts. <laughs> well, pastor, you should have done it this way, and you went and did it that way. Pastor, that person over there, they're not fit to be a member of our church. Do you know what they do? Do you know what they said? And if they're not addressing that to the pastor, well, they're talking with someone else. Uh, we're having fellowship, and there's a little group huddling. Oh, boy. <sighs> Fighting and, and, and backbiting and never an ounce of forgiveness. Paul said patience, right? And forbearance. We need to be a people who love each other and respect each other. And in your heart, there's room for disagreement. We're not all Republicans. We're not all Democrats. We're not even independent. Some of us don't even vote, and we could care less who wins the election, let alone what goes on in the church. <laughs> Paul is saying, this is how we walk. This is how we must live as Christians. There is no other way. And with the help and the grace of God, we can do it. Thank God for a decided walk. Point number two, I call it direction. And I am really thankful that we have direction. Last Sunday, in our service, I unintentionally Shorten the Lord's Prayer. Some of you are chuckling because you remember that. Now, I have been reciting this prayer all of my life. I mean, and I know all the versions. I know debts. I know trespasses. I know sins. When I was in the Catholic Church, I could recite this prayer in Latin. And some of you are waiting for me to recite this prayer. <laughs> Pater Nostrum, Kewe Chalis, Sanctificator, Nomen, Tumen. That's the beginning. That's as far as I'm going. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer. And yet, last Sunday, I skipped one of the most important parts of this prayer. I mean, I did not say, but deliver us from evil. And, and I know what happened. I was down here, and I was on cruise control. And I was already thinking about what I'm going to do next in the service. I wasn't paying attention. I confess I am sorry. <laughs> I think some of us, we walk our walk just the same way on cruise control. We're not paying attention. I've been in church so many years, I know what's coming up next. I pray the same prayers. I work the same jobs in volunteering. Read the same books. And what we do is we put ourselves in cruise control. We don't pay attention. We get nothing out of it. We're just kind of going through the motions. Aren't you glad that you can know? St. Paul writes in our scripture lesson that we are in the business of helping people walk in the right direction. And it says, build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full-grown Christians. We are mature Christians, I hope. <laughs> Sanctified saints, the direction is one that leads us out of death and darkness into light and life. I mean, why would you want to go through the motions and put yourself on cruise control when there's so much at stake? Pay attention. Keep focused. That reminds me of a story of a state trooper who pulls a car over that he's been following for about five or six miles, and uh, this car has just been weaving all over the place. Ma'am, by the way, it's blonde. Hey, I can't help it. 
that this really happened. Ma'am, I've been following you for five or six miles and you do nothing but weaving back and forth on the road. Are you having a problem? She replies, oh, officer, thank goodness that you've stopped me. I almost had an accident. I looked up there and there was a tree right in front of me and so I swerved to the left and then there was a tree and so I swerved to the right and then there was a tree and I don't know what is going on. I am just scared to death. Will you help me? And the state trooper reaches in to the side window to the rear view mirror and he says, ma'am, that's your air freshener. People outside of the church, without Jesus, are living their lives just like this. They're swerving to the left. They're swerving to the right. They're erratic. They think they're headed in the right direction, and so many times they are not. And it's scary and frightening. In chapter 2, verse 1, Paul reminds the Christian that once you were dead and doomed forever because of your many Sins, But then in verses 3 and 4, Paul rejoices over the fact that we are now headed in the right direction. There's no swerving to the left or right. We are in the right direction. He says, all of us used to live that way. Boom, boom, boom. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. Turn us around. No more erratic moving. <laughs> Steady forward. When, we, when he raised Christ from the dead. Aren't you glad you can know the right direction? I mean, we've walked in the direction that leads out of death into life. And, and we're now walking in that same direction right now. Right here in Dearborn. At the Congregational Church, we together are walking in one direction that leads out of sin to God and His holiness and His righteousness. A few verses later in chapter 4, Paul writes this, verse 17. With the Lord's authority, let me say this, live no longer as the ungodly. Walk no longer as the ungodly. Live no longer as the people who are just swerving all over the place. With Jesus, it's possible. Finally, the destination. I like this. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be like children forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or because someone has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we will hold to the truth in love, becoming more and more, in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. There it is, our destination. Our destination is the truth. Our destination is truth in love. Our destination is Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. This is where our walk is taking us. This is our final destination. Last week I officiated at the funeral of a friend. You know her, Mary Lou. She passed away at the age of 83. Her name was Joyce Renfro. She was a longtime member of the Methodist Church. The day before the funeral, I met with the family, her two children, and uh, we talked about her long life and what a blessing she was to the family and to the church. Um, I asked her, I asked them, I, excuse me, uh, what was it like growing up and having a mom like Joyce? And they smiled. I remember they said it was kind of like the Adams family. There was a lot of craziness going on. We knew that our mom, and they both, by the way, they were both adopted. They loved their adopted mother. And they told me, life was fun. And we were loved and protected. And mom and dad, they loved going on vacation.
connections, and we were always traveling. We had a, a camper. We were always going up north, going to the lake. We were driving down to Florida. We were going to Disney World. Life was wonderful. And that what they remembered about it most was the trips. Because when you go on a vacation together, or you go on a trip, or you go camping, the family's together, sometimes close quarters. But they said that was a good thing. And I replied to them, and now mom's on a journey. You're not with her, but she's on a fantastic journey. It's taking her to a kingdom. Not the kingdom of Disney, the kingdom of Jesus. And they smiled, and we just had a good service the next day, celebrating a good, long life and acknowledging that she's landed on the other shore. <laughs> oh, friends, we are on a journey together. And, and hopefully, each one of us, we are headed in the direction of Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, verse 10, Paul writes this. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things he planned for us long ago. I am so thankful for this walk. The power of God can transform us, make us into something that is beautiful, <laughs> create us anew. That's what the Bible says. And this has resulted in a life of good works. We are a church of good works. Amen. <laughs> I mean, we're putting together baskets for Thanksgiving and and we raise money for um, Vista Maria, and we give them clothing, and we help out, and we send to other organizations that need our help. We are a church of good works. Paul said we can do the good things he has planned. This is God's plan, not ours. God wants us to do this. And living that kind of a life, it, it can't get much better. That's our final destination. St. Paul the author, 2,000 years ago, in a jail cell, instructing Christians on how to live. He says, get out there and walk. Better yet, run. 